Hi, this is Professor McLaughlin providing you with a, I don't know how brief it will be, but briefer than it would be in the classroom lecture on chapter three, the US legal system. Um, this is a intimidating chapter for students and um, it should really be renamed the court system. Um, this chapter focuses on the courts, court rules, um, fundamental concepts for how cases make their way to courts at the state and federal level, and then how courts then decide whether to accept um, particular cases through concepts such as jurisdiction, um, personal jurisdiction, sub subject matter jurisdiction, and then some threshold, threshold questions, which are all court-related questions, whereas the U.S. legal system more broadly is how um, laws are made at the state and federal level and how the Constitution created our government at the federal level and then how the states grew from that to replicate the government. But obviously that's outside the scope of this course. But I do like to kind of mention that kind of, it's not misnamed, but um, as you can imagine, the, this class needs to go from a zero to maybe not 100, but at least 55 a little quickly to bring everybody up to speed on law and how it functions in society, uh, which is really um, what um, graduate work in law is all about as well. So um, lots of dense, really important topics in this chapter that you need to understand and this brief lecture will just hopefully uh, give you some foundational support um, to help you understand that. All right. So jurisdiction is a very fundamental, big question. What court do I belong in? And I want you to free yourself a little bit to um, rather than ex just accepting a news article that tells you that this court heard a certain matter, to understand what went on behind the scenes where everybody understood that the court had the power. How does the court have the power to even hear that dispute? When parties have a dispute, where do they go? Who knows that? It's not some mystery. And frequently, um, lawyers might get it wrong and send a case to um, the wrong court. But, but then who, who really ultimately decides that this case can be heard by this judge? And that's the court itself. So the lawyers involved in a matter, the parties involved in the matter, the issues involved in the matter are all floating, kind of orbiting the sun, so to speak, which is the court itself, which has its own integrity it must maintain, its own rules it has to follow and abide by. Courts are not all powerful. And um, I think it would make you a better business person if you understand the, the struggles that go on rather than accepting wholesale Courts have a lot of power. They never really do justice. Lawyers are lawyers, whether they're judges or advocates. And it's really not quite that simplistic. And um, when you get to the federal level or even at the state level with administrative judges and administrative law, like the Internal Revenue Service, um, there are valid struggles that go on to understand, um, am I in the right place? Do you have jurisdiction over me? Can you make a decision about my dispute? And, and that is a very fundamental question. So jurisdiction is given by a constitution. Jurisdiction is given by the U.S. Constitution. 
state courts are created by state constitutions and state civil codes of procedure, which tell a court what it has the power to hear. So original jurisdiction is all about cases when they first get to the legal system. That very first lawsuit, I'm suing you because I slipped and fell in your store. You're suing me um, because I'm a vendor that committed fraud or breached a contract, you as a uh, client, you as a corporation. Where do I go first? Wherever I go first, doesn't matter. Wherever I go first, that's original jurisdiction. Then if I lose and I want to appeal, I'm going to go to the next court. And that's, that's not the first court. First court are, is already done. I'm going to go to an appellate court. An appellate court has power to review a previous court's decision. Not everybody has that power. Only appellate courts have that power. We call that power jurisdiction, appellate jurisdiction. The power to review a previous judicial decision. Because you're asking the appellate court to decide if the lower court made an error. Was there a boo-boo? Did someone get confused? Was the law not followed? Was a mistake made? Not every court should be able to do that. Only appellate courts can do that. So jurisdiction is very fundamental. Can the court, does the court have power over me? Is it my first time in, in as a dispute? Think of me as a dispute. Is it my first time entering the legal system? Or am I asking you to review what a previous judge said about me? So that's jurisdiction. And then, like in Onion, there are layers of jurisdiction. So does the court have power over me as a person because I live in the county of Orange, but the accident or the breach of contract happened in the county of LA. And I'm a corporation and I'm located in the county of Orange, but the vendor who breached the contract is in the county of LA. Who should have power over me? Okay, in personam jurisdiction, power over me as a corporation, power over me as an individual. Where do I have a right to file this claim? Okay, so courts have power geographically over individuals. And sometimes there may be a time when, when you're looking at a particular dispute and you're like, yes, one person lives in Orange County or one corporation is located in, in Orange County, but most of the other parties, the vendor, the presidents, the, the contract was signed in LA. At some point, I, I may, you know, the Orange County court may have power over me, but it makes more sense to be in LA County because believe it or not, courts are really concerned with efficiency to get this dispute resolved quickly, I, I want this dispute to be heard in the place that makes the most sense, that I have the power, the court has the power to hear it, but also it's efficient. Where are the parties traveling from? Where are the most contacts? Where did most things happen? Where are most things located? So a very efficiency-related argument for impersonum jurisdiction. Having said that, courts, I mean, it would be a stretch for two persons with a contract dispute in Arizona to wind up in Orange County Superior Court. There would be no jurisdiction for the Orange County Court to hear a matter that happened in Arizona. All the parties are domiciled in Arizona. So that's a jurisdiction calculation. And then that's an impersonum jurisdiction calculation, a subject matter jurisdiction calculation looks at what kind of case is it? Is it a contracts case? Is this a family law case? Is this a tort claim? Is this a bankruptcy? And do I have a, as a court have power over that subject matter? So there are criminal courts. There are family law courts. There are bankruptcy courts. 
and those courts are limited by subject matter jurisdiction. So those kinds of organizational decisions are given to the courts. Pardon me, I have to cough. I'm so sorry. <coughs> given to the courts through various, either through the Constitution, through the Civil Procedure Code. But for your purposes, what I really want you to kind of get a sense of is there is an organization, there is a power that the court has to decide that it has over you, and there are arguments to be made that the court has no power over a particular dispute. And those are jurisdictional arguments. So some courts, and typically federal courts, have exclusive jurisdiction over exclusive subject matter. So bankruptcy is federal law. Federal cr criminal prosecutions are federal law. Uh, patent, trademark, and copyright claims, which are all intellectual property, are federal. So they'll go to a federal court. And that's another layer of the onion where you want to begin to ask, is this a, a federal case or a state case? And that's I don't know if anybody this day and age is familiar with the euphemism. Don't make a federal case out of it. You know, federal courts are bigger. They have more powers. State courts are smaller and and um, they have less powers. Um, they have powers given to them by the federal government, by the state constitution. Things that the feds don't want to dispute, uh, hear disputes for, remain in state court. So if you can imagine it, if, if you have a dispute that maybe was activities that involve two different states, how are you going to decide? So California and Arizona, corporation in L.A., does business with a vendor in Phoenix, Arizona, and they have a dispute. Where's that dispute going to go? Arizona people don't want to drive to L.A., and the LA people do not want to go to Arizona, where are we going to have that dispute heard? Well, where you have citizens from two different states involved, we call that a diversity of citizenship case where you may have access to the federal courts. So rather than allow the, the, the parties to fight over a kind of a tug of war, which where are we going to go, LA or Phoenix, we have rules that say if you have diversity of citizenship, corporations, individuals from different states, you have access to the federal courts. And we call that diversity of citizenship cases and, and where in situations where you might have access to federal or state courts, we call that concurrent jurisdiction. But there are specific rules for how you get into federal um, court. Uh, federal jurisdiction is over things that are a federal question, which is federal law, U.S. law, and diversity of citizenship cases, and there are also dollar amount requirements. So state jurisdiction is everything that the feds don't want, everything falling outside of exclusive federal jurisdiction. So one really interesting case that demonstrates this um, is the Hertz Corp v. Friend case. And so now we'll talk a little bit about cases to help you apply kind of what you're reading and learning um, in these chapters. And the question in this case was, and I encourage you to maybe pause and read the case before you listen to this lecture um, and read the chapter for sure before you listen to the lectures. But the issue here was you know, there were activities in different states. There were activities all over the place. Where should this decision be heard? You know, do I look where the corporation is incorporated? Do I look where it's headquartered? How do I decide, particularly for a corporation, where the jurisdiction is? And if you leave it up to the advocates, the parties who are the, the lawyers who are representing the parties, they're going to go for the place that makes the most sense for them. But at the end of the day, the court has to decide on behalf of the entire dispute, the plaintiff and the defendant. 
And so the court has to make a decision. And remember that we're in a legal system where there's precedent, meaning if a court makes a decision, another court needs to follow it. So this laborious decision-making and analysis that goes on, this Hamlet-like hand-wringing where I'm trying to make a decision is because when a federal court makes a decision, this is a U.S. Supreme Court in this in the Hertz case, the rest of the, the country has to follow it. So they make decisions infrequently. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's a lot of soul searching and obviously a lot of politics involved. That's the nature of our system. Uh, if you want to change it, you got to uh, be proactive and vote. And um, But as it is right now, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court making a decision. All the other courts have to follow it. It's the end of the road, so to speak, in terms of um, uh, appellate jurisdiction. So two California residents sue Hertz. How does a court decide if it's got jurisdiction? You know, a lot of cars get rented in California. It's a drivey kind of place. Got to have a car out here. Um, on the East Coast, you can take a train. You can take a subway in New York, but lots of trains in Philadelphia and New Jersey. Um, you know, Hertz is incorporated in Delaware. It's headquartered in New Jersey. California residents sue them. Where should they go? Do they go to federal court? Do they go to state court? And what state court? So the court looked at um, previous decisions in this matter and decided it kind of wanted to come, kind of, it wanted to come up with a new test, a new analysis for how to decide who had jurisdiction. And that was the nerve center approach that, you know, I don't need to just look at the headquarters or a single place of business. And instead, I want to know or where they do the most business, where does Hertz rent the most cars, you know, what's a good way for me to come up with a, a rule for other courts to follow? And that rule was the nerve center approach. We want to look, uh, we want to come up with a, a decision making paradigm that looks at the nerve center of the business. Where is it all happening? And the court concluded in this case that the nerve center is usually the headquarters. Um, and that was true for this court. And the headquarters was in New Jersey. And that was going to be where um, citizenship was um, and, and an important jurisdictional decision for the court uh, in this dispute. So... The U.S. court system is like a big triangle, and I'm sorry I don't have the whiteboard open. I have not uh, graduated to that um, ability on this um, software system. But I want you to imagine in a triangle around this slide where the fattest part of the triangle is the lowest bullet point. It's the federal trial courts. It's fat. There's a lot of them down there. And then you get a thinner part of the triangle is the intermediate courts of appeals. There's fewer of them. And then the very tip of the triangle is the U.S. Supreme Court. So it's a hierarchy. You enter the system at the bottom. You have lots of trial courts. You have limited right to appeal and fewer courts. And then you have one final shot, which is the final recourse, the final court that can hear your case, which is the U.S. Supreme Court. The state court system is no different. Triangle on this slide, uh, sorry, on this slide will show a lot of state trial courts at the bottom, fewer intermediate courts of appeal, and then one final state Supreme Court. So in addition to um, jurisdiction, courts also ask three additional or threshold questions. Does this party have standing to sue? Is this a justiciable controversy? And is the dispute ripe for resolution? So these are huge questions of law. I'm going to 
spend three minutes on it, which doesn't do it justice, but that's all we have time for. So standing to sue is a theory that says you really can't sue unless you're the one who's harmed. So if you have a friend who is involved in a breach of contract and the friend doesn't want to sue, you cannot sue on their behalf. Sometimes parents can sue on behalf of their children. That's different, especially minors or adult children who are incapacitated, like some of the right, uh, you know, um, cases where you want to uh, terminate a feeding tube or, or stop a breathing apparatus. But standing to sue says you only have a right to sue if you were the person harmed. You cannot sue on behalf of mankind for the most part. You cannot sue on someone else's behalf. Case or controversy says it has to be something that a court can resolve. You cannot ask the court to declare that there is a God, declare that um, love exists, prove that unidentified flying objects exist. It has to be a dispute a court can resolve, something justiciable. And then finally, ripeness says you can't sue too soon and you can't sue too late. So uh, best examples of this are uh, cases that involve terminating a pregnancy. You need to be pregnant. Can't sue before you've conceived. And you have to sue before the baby is born. Um, another great example or very very um, factually good example are same-sex marriage cases where you have to sue at the time. It's, it's kind of why when same-sex marriages, it's not why, but it you'll get a lot of couples that uh, when same-sex marriages become legal, they'll go get married, um, you know, and then if it becomes illegal in a specific state, um, you know, you, you cannot sue to declare same-sex marriage constitutional or unconstitutional unless you're actually married. It doesn't, the, the court doesn't um, declare things um, as valid or invalid. You have to sue. So the case before the Supreme Court right now for same-sex marriage is an Ohio couple. And I don't think that decision's out yet. We would have heard in the news. But an Ohio couple was validly married in another state. Ohio does not recognize same-sex marriage. They also adopted a child in another state in Ohio, since it doesn't recognize the same-sex marriage, did not recognize the adoption as valid as well. And so that case made it to the Supreme Court where the Ohio couple was challenging Ohio's right to um, not recognize a same-sex marriage from another case, as well as an adoption from another case. That's right. An adoption happened. Marriage happened. You can't do it too soon. Um, that's ripeness. So these next couple of slides, the, the steps in civil litigation. So many of you are very familiar with this because there's a lot of TV shows that show you all this stuff. But just quickly, informal negotiations where you say, hey, um, you know, I'm not feeling too good about this breach of contract. Can we talk about it? Can, I, can we have a discussion? Yes, that doesn't go well. Okay, I'm going to sue you. Fine, sue me. And then there's rules within the civil litigation, the civil procedure code that says, um, you know, I have a right also under the Constitution be, to be notified that I'm being sued. And that resulted in service of process. And so service of process is where you get the sheriff or somebody over 18 to serve somebody else and say, hey, just so you know, you're being sued. And that completion of that process is very uh, important for constitutional reasons, but also for civil procedure reasons. And then um, everybody has a right to respond after I've been sued. Hey, I didn't do it. Um, everything they said in the complaint is wrong. And then you'll have pretrial motions, a motion to dismiss this case, um, motion to compel um, certain documents be turned over, that kind of thing. You'll have discovery where I get to interview potential witnesses under oath and find out what they're going to say. I get to ask you for documents. You get to ask me for documents. 
pretrial conferences, um, jury selection, which is just huge and constitutional and lots of protections. Uh, and then what most people are familiar with is what you see, the most interesting part, which is going to be um, opening statements at trial, examining the witnesses under oath, um, closing arguments, and then letting the jury know what they really need to decide, what, what's the law that they're deciding on, and having that, that um, law applied to the facts that were in the case. Um, appellate procedure, uh, for the most part, this slide is really meant to uh, give you an idea. So we've gone through the original trial, and when we go up to the appellate court, we cannot get all those witnesses in there again. The appellate court's going to make a decision based on the record that's provided them from the trial below. You do not get a second bite of the apple, which is a very popular thing to say in law. Your only bite of the apple is your first trial court when you go, which is why you object and you make sure things get in the record. Because if you do appeal, if you do lose and you appeal, that's all the appellate court gets to say. You don't get it. You get a little bit of chance to brief and describe uh, what went on. But for the most part, that's your one bite of the apple is a trial court. When it goes up to the appellate court for review, the appellate court can either affirm what went on in the lower court, request a modification. Uh, this was okay, that wasn't so hot. We need to modify what happened below by this, this, and this. They could reverse what happened below. So that would be um, a reversal. We're gonna make a 180 degree turn. Is that right? No, 360 degree turn, go in the opposite direction. Or we could, the appellate court could remand it, which means sending it back to the lower court to look at it again with specific instructions. So those are some um, words that would be good to know for appellate court decision making. So this, this chapter is super important for the rest of the course because the rest of the course talks about cases and it talks about jurisdiction and they talk about right to hearing. And so chapter three works very closely um, with the remainder of the course. Uh, understanding chapter three and the vocabulary in this chapter um, is very important for the other chapters for the remainder of the course. These, as I said before, um, these, these chapters are building a foundation this chapter, chapter four, chapter five, constitutional law, for uh, what we see moving forward in terms of um, cases that we're going to read, but also understanding of the specific areas of the law when we get to um, the chapters that cover specific areas of law, which happens so quickly um, with these summer courses. Uh, okay, I'm going to end it there. Hi, this is Professor McLaughlin. I'd like to provide you all with a lecture um, for summer 2015 management 12A class that uh, covers chapter four and five, but focuses on the cases and um, perhaps also throwing in some fundamental concepts that will help uh, uh, guide your studying for the exam, um, but also uh, kind of cement these thoughts and, and concepts so that you, uh, chapter four and five are very important for the remainder of the course because um, business law, chapter four is about alternatives to litigation and business law has a lot of disputes, business um, contracts, disputes with vendors, employee disputes. And much of that is conducted through alternatives to litigation. A lot of negotiation, a lot of informal mediation goes on in the workplace. And for those of you who are working, I encourage you to look around and look in your own employee handbook, um, look on your company website if it has one to determine how they're resolving um, disputes internally and maybe externally. And, and, and why is that? Um, 
if you've paid attention to litigation in the United States on a personal or a business level, um, it's it can be very expensive. It takes a long time. Um, it's very crowded. Typically, you need a lawyer. Uh, it's very expensive. And so business has for centuries um, developed uh, expert groups who can help resolve disputes. And that is um, when I did mention the medieval guilds and um, uh, kind of the Greek and Roman uh, business dispute resolution through mediation. Um, uh, one of the um, uh, initial reasons why alternatives to a judge were considered was because in many industries, having someone who understands your industry help resolve the dispute is very advantageous. When you are in litigation, you spend most of your time explaining to the judge or the jury the science of a car crash or the forensics of a criminal act. And all of that takes time and energy with expert witnesses. How much better would it be if you had a um, dispute that had to do with a scientific process? What a time saver to have a panel of three arbitrators who were scientists or one arbitrator who's a scientist, a lawyer, and a uh, um, somebody who's been resolving scientific disputes, um, but from a different profession. Um, that is a huge advantage as well. It's a time saver. So one another aspect of um, business disputing that goes to arbitration and mediation is looking for someone who's familiar with your with their uh, that particular industry. For example, I for about twenty years have been a securities arbitrator. I worked in the securities industry before I went to law school. I became an arbitrator shortly after law school. I, I was an equity trader. I worked on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And so I serve as an arbitrator on a panel of experts familiar with the securities industry. And that is a huge time saver for lawyers and um, people who bring um, disputes against brokers or disputes against brokerage firms or brokers who have disputes with an employer brokerage firm. You don't have to explain how the industry works to me. Instead, we can get right to, or the other arbitrators I serve with. Instead, we get right to the um, resolution of the dispute. Okay. So uh, that additional information um, should add to your reading and and um, kind of getting back. I'm going to forward to uh, this is currently on slide four six, which talks about the ADR continuum. I'd like to forward to um, a couple of other slides and focus on the cases that you need to be familiar with in chapter four, and also. Um, uh, tell you that we come back to international and domestic business disputing through arbitration throughout the course. So it's good to get a handle on this stuff early besides the exam. Um, it helps um, and will help in your business career as well. Okay. Um, understanding that business can, business is uh, through contracts with an arbitration clause, but also in, through their employee handbook can choose lots of different ways to resolve a dispute. And your book talks about there's facilitation, negotiation. Um, many large organizations have what's called an ombudsman. Um, if you have a very large corporation, like think of a media corporation, uh, Thomson Reuters employs over 100,000 people worldwide. And uh, they could set up their own uh, essentially dispute resolution department where all disputes go first before you're allowed to take it out um, into litigation. And that's a time saver, a money saver, and maybe a relationship saver as well. So one of the big advantages of these informal, uh, non-litigious, not yet litigious dispute resolution methods is that your, your um, ability to maybe maintain 
an employer-employee relationship, your ability to maintain a relationship with a vendor that you've been contracting with for multiple years. Um, disputes don't always arise. Um, it's not always personal. Sometimes it's personal when it's not personal, but you can't resolve it. You bring a third party who's neutral, not connected to the dispute, who has no conflicts of interest, no bias, and allow them to um, uh, guide the, the, the disputing parties through a process um, that's not litigation and um, facilitating and um, uh, helping them come to a, a resolution that might uh, maintain that relationship and allow um, a contractual relationship to go on for many more years. Okay, I'm just forwarding a couple more slides. Um, uh, focusing on the arbitration clause itself. Your book does a really good job of, of covering this. I want you to understand that the arbitration clause is part of a contract. Um, mediation is very different. You usually agree with the person, with the party that you're having a dispute with to have, bring a mediator in, um, or a court can require you to go to mediation in an attempt to settle, resolve a dispute. Um, most uh, cases in the United States are not litigated. Only 5% go to litigation. 95% settle. And sometimes that is because of um, mediation efforts, uh, arbitration clauses where arbitration has um, uh, maybe it, uh, sometimes disputes settle during the arbitration. Uh, sometimes litigation settles during the, the trial. Um, parties, uh, you know, new facts arise, parties come to an understanding of the dispute. Um, the entire, um, um, all dispute resolution processes are an attempt, and it kind of begs the question, are an attempt to resolve the dispute. Litigation just does it in kind of a brutal way. <laughs> um, arbitration and negotiation try and do it in a more collaborative way. So arbitration clauses are found in contracts. Take a look at what your book talks about in terms of what can be in the arbitration clause. It can be very specific. Contracts don't, you know, you can add and amend contracts. You can make the arbitration clause extremely specific, detailing, you know, what city you want to have the dispute resolved in, how much you want to pay the arbitrators, um, you know, what rules apply. So it's a lot of flexibility, whereas in state court, you know, you are just entering the system and the system tells you how to do things. And there is a efficiency and an efficacy to that as well. Um, okay, so just fast forwarding. What, what we talked about on um, Monday night in our class was the uh, case opener in Chapter 4 for Hooters and, and what, it, what it details. Um, is a unconscionable um, contract and unconscionable arbitration agreement where um, uh, th this is a legal term of art that just describes a situation that is very oppressive, dictated by a dominant for party, um, manifestly unfair, and the law rejects this um, despite what um, I'll have to look into what your classmate said that Hooters still does this. Um, you know, that's just a shame. I'm still upset about that. Okay, so we talked about Hooters. I'm not going to test you on the Gilmer case. Um, I want you to know about mediation. Um, it, it's covered very well in the book. I want to get to, and negotiation, I don't spend a, line, a lot of time talking about it. Um, you know, negotiation goes all on all the time in business. It is a dispute resolution process, but it's also much more than that. It is a method by which deals are made, a method by which contracts are um, discussed. It goes on in meetings. You probably do it all the time in your professional and personal life. Students negotiate with me all the time. So that is a, um, it, it, it is a dispute resolution process. Um, it is also a um, part of civil litigation where you begin negotiating early on with uh, someone you're having a dispute with, someone you've had a car wreck with, lawyers negotiate. So 
it's just very broad and and um, and has many um, characteristics, one of which is dispute resolution. So that's kind of all I want you to know about negotiation. Um, all right, so let's talk about the Concepcion case. This is an important case, and, and hopefully you'll see when you begin to look at cases in this book, particularly in Chapter 4 um, uh, and 5, uh, following along with our critical legal thinking, you are looking at cases and trying, what is, why is this case in this chapter? And the Concepcion case is in this chapter because someone had a cell phone agreement, that cell phone agreement said they had to go to arbitration and they didn't want to. And it, Concepcion simply stands for the U.S. Supreme Court saying that if you sign a contract that has a binding arbitration clause and that arbitration clause isn't unconscionable, you weren't dominated by the other party, then you're bound by it and you cannot um, simply reject it in order to get into some other class action lawsuit or something else. Instead, what the Concepcion case stands for is the U.S. Supreme Court respecting the federal arbitration, um, um, the legislation um, uh, under all the federal arbitration laws that say that if parties enter into these arbitration clauses voluntarily and consensually, then the law needs to respect that. And you don't get to just burn it when it suits you. Um, and, and this promotes the integrity of arbitration agreements, um, the consistency of upholding them, and, um, uh, and, and if they are binding and there's nothing wrong with them, then it's important for the courts to respect it. Um, so Concepcion, the parties wanted to um, uh, get out of their cell phone agreement and the US Supreme Court said no. Um, on the slide that we're looking at, slide 424, I say, why does this case look so weird? Because it's heavily excerpted, so, or excerpted. So what you're looking at is a very, um, uh, uh, it's hard, maybe a little hard to read because it doesn't give you the, um, it gives you very uh, small portions of the case um, that are uh, a little difficult to um, read. But I encourage you to uh, read it anyway and try and get a sense of what the court was grappling with. Um, okay, so it's the AT&T um, Mobility LLC versus Concepcion, and it's case 4-1 in your book. Um, something we didn't talk about um, Monday night was that the court, there are within the Civil Procedure Code and within state courts and some federal courts, um, by, uh, uh, mandatory alternative dispute resolution. And these, as you might imagine when you think of the court system, um, a very busy, crowded court is going to uh, want to adopt uh, methods for dispute resolution that would uh, maybe guide parties toward a settlement agreement and get them keep them out of the court um, and get the dispute resolved um, outside of the um, courtroom. And those are court annexed alternative dispute resolution um, methods. And and the best example is just family law and mandatory. Um, family law uh, mediation uh, before you get the, the trial for dissolution. Uh, and then we talked about international uh, disputes and that's covered well in your book and we cover it again in chapter six. So this won't be the last time you see that. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do now is go to chapter five and talk um, about the cases in that chapter. Um, and uh, also kind of give you a, um, uh, well, just talk in more detail about the cases and the PowerPoints in Chapter 5. So 
For every law that gets written or passed by the U.S. Congress or the California State Legislature, they have to locate their power to pass that law within the Constitution. So the cases in Chapter 5 are about, um, uh, well, let's just focus on the Brazoncala case v. Morrison, Case 5-1. This case is about whether Congress has the right to pass this law. And I think it's a, a good case to have in this um, chapter because the, the fact that it's about a, um, uh, a rape um, kind of uh, um, creates the, the um, a very good factual scenario that helps you um, think about how Congress could possibly pass a law um, that provides a penalty, or what the slide says, a civil rem remedy for rape, which is criminal and typically punished uh, criminally at the state level. Uh, the Cong Congress has passed a law, the Violence Against Women Act, which attempts to punish it across the United States and claims to have the authority to do this through the interstate, through the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. So the Commerce Clause, as you've read in Chapter 5, gives Congress the power to regulate anything that crosses state lines. So it can regulate the size of mud flaps on the back of a truck that's going to go from California to Maine. It can regulate so that if California says mud flaps on the back of a truck must be 16 inches, uh, Maine isn't allowed to say mud flaps on the back of a truck must be 14 inches because if the states have differing regulations for mud flaps that cover the back of the truck, you don't want to have to have a truck stop when it gets to the main border, pull over, change the size of the mud flaps. And you don't want to have the law enforcement stopping all these uh, interstate trucking um, because they have the wrong size mud flaps. No, you want the federal government to have a uniform, consistent law so that interstate commerce can be conducted smoothly. Um, the best example of how this is in stark this this concept of uh, having consistent laws. Um, Same-sex marriage and uh, marijuana legislation are a great example of how the federal government is grappling right now with inconsistent laws throughout the states that affect interstate commerce. So you can imagine, um, you know, it's not just the, the smoking of marijuana that will affect interstate commerce, it's the shipping of a derivative products and oil and uh, maybe things, uh, whatever the um, products are derived from um, the plant itself. Can you ship that? Can you regulate it? And all of this, I want you to think about it outside the fact, if it, that's possible, that it's a class one drug. So um, as you look at the Brazoncala case, and I want to forward the slides a little bit, um, yes, it's, it was a terrible act, and um, she uh, filed a complaint that she was raped. Um, and students frequently ask, well, why did she even file a claim under the Violence Against Women Act against Virginia Tech, or the attackers? And that, I don't know, that might be, she may have filed a criminal complaint as well, but it's possible that under the Violence Against Women Act, she could have recovered quite a bit of money um, because it's a, a civil act. It's a civil, provides a civil remedy um, for a criminal act. And um, uh, the holding in that case, the whole point of that case is that the U.S. Supreme Court said Congress really did not have the power to regulate non-economic violent criminal conduct. There was no economic connection between violence against women. And um, yes, it was a terrible act and we don't want violence against women, but we want to begin to 
develop these skills for understanding how sometimes Supreme Court decisions and court decisions in general say very small and narrow things. And you're like, that's it. Um, they're, they're frequently uh, very restricted in the holdings, um, not solving the world's problems or violence against women. That's not the purpose of the judiciary or of cases. You want cases to resolve very narrow issues um, and let Congress pass laws that solve social problems and uh, in general, uh, violence against women and, and other big problems. The, that's not the, the role of the judiciary, and it's not the role of cases in general. Okay, I'm going to um, forward a couple of slides. So uh, just to kind of um, talk a little bit uh, about a second case, the Family Winemakers of California versus Jenkins. Um this case, uh, the issue is a 2006 Massachusetts law, uh, law that um, violated the Commerce Clause by putting limits on how certain sized wineries could distribute wine. Sorry, I just want to pull the case up in my book. And um, the issue is, can, Mass can did this Massachusetts law violate the Commerce Clause? And the court held that it did because it, it created a, it, it put a limit on um, uh, what this slide describes as a gallonage cap um, and it, it, it changed a competitive balance um, towards Massachusetts wineries and against out-of-state wineries. And this is a, another dimension of the Commerce Clause that limits the state's ability to pass laws that favor its own industry. Now, having said that, I'm sure maybe in your life or you're thinking right now of situations where uh, states can subsidize or promote a particular industry over another industry. Um, states can favor through subsidies or uh, economic um, zones particular industries. But what states cannot do uh, constitutionally is, is um, pass laws that favor their own industry and um, uh, and affects the ability of out-of-state businesses to compete within that state. So Massachusetts passed a law. It was uh, unconstitutional because it favored, intentionally or not, through a um, gallonage limitation, um, the ability of California winemakers to sell wine in the state of Massachusetts. So this, this case is... Um, uh, hopefully furthering your understanding of how the commerce cause works. It's not just about um, uh, U.S. Congress passing laws that, that it doesn't have power to under the commerce cause. It's also limiting the state's ability to pass domestic laws that affect only its only the state of Massachusetts, but have an anti-competitive or unfairly benefits Massachusetts wineries against um, out-of-state wineries that we may want to sell within the state of Massachusetts. Okay, then a couple of other things I wanted to talk about. This whole chapter and these slides for Chapter 5 are just um, discussing clauses within the Constitution that give power or restrict power. So another great example of business-related um, uh, power-granting clauses within the federal government are the taxing and spending power. So the federal government is given the power under the U.S. Constitution to lay and collect taxes against business, against individuals. Those taxes are then used um, because the government has the power under the spending clause at a state and federal level to 
develop industry, encourage certain industry, um, discourage the development of other industries. And if you recall, during the credit crisis, the federal government used the TARP funds, um, which were tax, uh, tax taxes that they had raised to help bail out um, certain banks and uh, other industries. And then many of those banks and industries had to pay back the TARP money that they received. And, and um, this power of the, for the government to do this is under the taxing and spending clause. Um, and then two really important clauses for um, our current day um, struggles are the privileges and immunities clause and the full faith and credit clause. So when you go to Nevada, you do not get discriminated against because you're a California resident because of the privileges and immunities clause in the U.S. Constitution, which says if I go to Nevada, I can get a job, I can remain a California resident for a certain period of time. Some of you know, as you, when you move, eventually you've got to get a new driver's license. If you're going to remain in a new state, you have to get a driver's license, um, and become a domicile of that state. And that's that's okay, states can require that. Um, but let's say I, I go to Nevada for 30 days, I have a 30 day job, I can buy property in Nevada and I remain a California resident and Nevada can't discriminate against me. It, can, it must afford me all the privileges and immunities, those protections and rights that Nevada residents have even though I remain a California resident. Then the full faith and credit clause um, and I know that some of this may be a repetition of the other podcast you listened to. I, I apologize for that. Um, uh, I encourage you to turn it off if, if it becomes repetitive. <laughs> um, the full faith and credit clause is just um, saying that, you know, if I have a judgment in California, it's respected in Nevada or Arizona or any other state. If I get married in California, that's respected in another state. And this clause is where we have trouble with uh, same-sex marriages where some states grant it and some states don't. The amendments are, are really um, covered well in your book. What I want to encourage you to do is when you look at the cases in Chapter 5, you're looking at the way that the um, government the 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 U.S. the U.S. Supreme Court is weighing the power of the government to regulate a certain activity and the rights of whomever it is, if it's an entity or a corporation or an individual, to exercise a particular right. So the government has a right to um, hold hearings and ask people questions. And so, for example, under the Fifth Amendment, individuals also have the right at that hearing to plead the Fifth Amendment and not testify against themselves. Um, Fifth Amendment has a lot of um, other things in it. One of the big ones is uh, the government isn't allowed to take property for public use without just compensation. Um, so if the government wants to build a freeway, um, but there are properties in that um, location, the government needs to provide just compensation and buy um, those properties. Just compensation does not mean fair market value, um, but that's also a constitutional provision in the Fifth Amendment. And all of these are very, very historical. When you think about um, the colony, U.S. colonies were occupied by um, the English for quite a long period of time. And so many of the amendments to the Constitution are reactions to um, you know, uh, the English taking property and not providing compensation, the English, um, you know, uh, trying people um, in absentia without them knowing they were even um, accused of a particular crime and they're already found guilty. Um, so our right to a hearing, our right to due process, which is being notified of uh, the fact that we're being sued, notified that we're being charged with a particular crime, then the right to go to that hearing, a right to testify, a right to have witnesses um, to help defend against a particular liability or a particular crime. Um, all of those things are 
um, many of those things in the Bill of Rights, which is the first 10 amendments, are in response to historical things that happened. I think that's all the cases for chapter five. Um, I'm now on the slide that says uh, talks about equal protection. This is really important, as I mentioned in the um, class on Monday night. Equal protection um, is uh, the U.S. Supreme Court found that the 14th Amendment uh, provides equal protection under the laws, and it defined, pro pardon me, protected classes. Um, protected classes. Oh, I think we have one more case coming up. Protected classes that that uh, you're uh, must treat equally. So you're not allowed to treat people different because of race, um, religion, national origin. Uh, we want to treat similarly, situ similarly situated individuals the same, regardless of um, those differences. Um, but there are some protected classes that we provide more protection and some protected classes that we provide less protection. For example, there's less equal protection for sexual orientation. It's not the same level of protection under the Constitution. We provide less protection for for gender differences, we provide less protection for people to, for, with disabilities and people um, of different ages. In addition, and as we move on, you're going to see that we also provide, you know, maybe we didn't find that protection in the U.S. Constitution, but Congress passed the American with Disabilities Act. Congress passed and developed the EEOC, so we have Equal Opportunity Commission and laws that protect those people. So uh, we want to continue to put each chapter and laws from that chapter in its own box. Um, the Constitution is pervasive and discussions about things under the Constitution are, are pervasive throughout the course, but we want to put it in the box that it belongs in, make sure we're not talking about constitutional issues when actually Discriminate the discrimination claim I'm bring is un, bringing is under a separate law. It's not a constitutional um, violation. Instead, it's a violation of a California code provision. So we'll begin to develop that skill to begin to ask yourself those questions. Am I in? Is this a constitutional issue, or are they claiming discrimination under a California code provision? It's really, really different things, and maybe they're doing both. But maybe they only prevail in one particular claim. So that's why reading the cases is really important because it begins to, uh, you begin to develop that ability to say, well, all right, well, hang on, where am I? What is the issue? What laws are they talking about? Are they state and federal? And is there a constitutional issue? And as you begin to see that people can bring claims in multiple ways, just like why did Brazonkala, I know I mispronounce her name, bring a claim under the Violence Against Women Act? Did she bring a rape claim under the state of Virginia criminal code? Were there violations of Virginia Tech's code of conduct? You begin to see that there are different claims that can be brought. It's, it's a great practice to first ask, what's the issue? What are the facts? What rules am I looking at? And how did the court conclude based in this very, very specific narrow case? So the final slides don't really talk about a particular case, but they do. These are tests that were developed over uh, many, many Supreme Court cases. And it, 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 what these tests kind of describe are those different levels of protection that I was discussing a couple minutes ago. So there are some classes, suspect classifications, where we do not let people um, treat individuals or entities differently. We provide strict scrutiny. We look at it very carefully. If somebody's being treated differently because of race, national origin, or citizenship, okay? Top, top scrutiny for that. So the government, if it passes a law and treats somebody differently because of that, we're very careful to analyze that very carefully. Um, in the court. But then there are other areas such as gender, legitimacy of children, 
that we only give it intermediate scrutiny. So if there's an important government objective to uh, treating genders differently, we allow the government to do that. We're not looking at it strictly. We're kind, we're kind of in the middle. We're going to give it, you know, we're going to look at it. It's important, but we don't strictly scrutinize like we do for race, national origin, and citizenship. And then finally, rational basis. So if the government has a legitimate reason to pass a law that impacts unequally other protected classes, we're going to let that go if the government can show a legitimate governmental interest in, in regulating it. Okay, so let me tell you my um, a little story, a little set of cases that might clarify this. So um, if your religion is Santeria, and in Santeria you're required to, and it's a religion that's found mostly in um, South America, Cuba, if that religion requires you to sacrifice a live goat as part of the exercise and practice of your religion. And that happens a lot. That might violate some health and safety code provisions in a particular city, might violate some animal welfare provisions in a particular city. Um, there may be uh, laws that regulate what you do with that blood, how you dispose of it, how you dispose of the carcass, um, how the goat is kept. And those are legitimate governmental interests. The government's job is to keep society running orderly so that we don't get sick, um, so that uh, health and safety is uh, regulated and managed. So in Miami, at one time, many, many years ago, there was a large influx of Cuban immigrants who practiced Santeria. And the city of Miami wanted to shut down the um, uh, practice of killing live animals. I, I believe it's been goats. I haven't read the case for a while, but I believe it was goats. And they were able to do it through the legitimate government interest of a um, health and safety um, code provision in the city of Miami that said the killing of live animals had to happen in a butcher shop with proper drainage and um, all the cleaning and whatever the safety requirements were for butcheries. And the people practicing Santeria asserted their First Amendment right to practice their religion without being shut down by the government. But that only got a rational basis test um, because it wasn't part of strict scrutiny or intimate, I intermediate scrutiny. Although I would say that under even intermediate scrutiny, um, the government had an important governmental interest in not seeing um, in seeing that this activity was done in a safe way, so that there was no contamination and nobody got sick. Um, so that was allowed, the government was allowed to regulate that and was allowed to stop that activity. And so this brings, this will be my final comment. Um, I apologize for the long podcast. Hopefully it's been helpful, but this brings me back to what I want you to continue to see for any kind of case on cons the constitutionality of a government activity is it's weighing. And these last three slides, it's weighing in different ways, either strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, or rational basis test, it's weighing the right of the government to stop this activity against the right of the individual or entity to exercise this right. And it does it in these three different ways, either strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, or rational basis. And so that's why I say in class, well, we don't strictly protect people with disabilities. We don't strictly protect gender. We do it in a slightly less strict way. We consider, um, you know, under our constitution, we believe the government has a right to um, assert an important interest of its own. And if that infringes on a basic fundamental right found in the constitution, that's okay. And these tests were developed under the 14th amendment through many, many um, um, Supreme Court decisions. 
All right, I'll leave it there. Um, I'll put a study guide up today for you guys. And um, good luck in your reading and good luck on the exam. Hi, this is Professor McLaughlin. This uh, short lecture is on Chapter 6, highlighting uh, some of the um, content that I was not able to cover in the lecture. This audio, uh, and if you're looking at the um, um, video as well, is just... Uh, um, not, not the PowerPoints, but instead I'm going to type in some of the um, important um, vocabulary, important pieces of legislation um, that I'll be briefly lecturing about. So Chapter 6 is International and Comparative Law. And there's a lot out there that this chapter doesn't cover. Um, and there are a lot of different facets to international law, private international transactions, which involve contract law, um, but uh, and also public law, which will be laws and conventions that are uh, set forth by the United Nations or other international bodies. And then in addition to all of that, we have trade law. So uh, I want you to, um, s after reading Chapter 6, begin to see that there are many ways to do business internationally. And how you form or structure that international transaction, either a joint venture, a franchise, or you're actually doing trade, where you're um, trading tea or palm oil or some kind of commodity, um, exporting or importing it, uh, depending on your form of business org and the actual business that you're in, uh, different areas of international law um, will affect it. So we'll, we'll try and, it, so it's a very broad chapter, a very large chapter, um, uh, which broadly covers the area, and the area is very complex. So one of the main pieces of legislation uh, or trade agreements that we didn't get to is GATT, GATT, G-A-T-T, -T, which stands for the um, General Agreement on Trade and Tariff, Trade and Tariffs. Um, is a negotiated international agreement whose purpose is to reduce trade barriers, reducing barriers to trade. And think about it. What are all the barriers that um, a business would encounter when trying to trade um, a commodity? And we could stick with palm oil, something that's physical, something that need, is, an, is extracted from trees, um, all the barriers to importing that palm oil or exporting that palm oil would include physical barriers, geographic barriers. Am I flying it? Is it going on a boat? Um, manufacturing barriers, health and safety barriers, price problems, um, a post 9-11 uh, world where banking issues, um, you know, full disclosure uh, issues and strict customs laws and searching uh, ability for the um, items to be searched when they when they enter the United States or exit the United States. Costs also, are there special costs for uh, importing or exporting the palm oil from wherever you're getting it? And typically it's going to be someplace where there's a, I think a rainforest uh, is where they get palm oil. So what the a general agreement on trades and tariffs does is it allows countries to get together and lower those barriers. 
um, and say and designate um, trading partners who have a favorable status. And that negotiated agreement will delineate what the reduction in barriers are. So I'm not going to, you're a favored trading partner that I get palm oil from, and I'm going to reduce tariffs to um, palm oil's entry into the U.S. markets. I'm going to speed up processes, potentially. Um, and that is the whole purpose of GATT. That is also the purpose in Chapter 6 of the regional trade agreements. So NAFTA, which is a regional trade agreement between um, Mexico, the United States, and Canada, uh, reduces um, all sorts of things. Uh, it allows trucks to cross the border more easily from those two countries. There were labor agreements part of NAFTA. And um, NAFTA hasn't worked out quite the way it had hoped to work out. And some of that is because of problems in the U.S. and also uh, governance problems in Mexico and drug-related um, problems uh, controlling um, drugs uh, in Mexico um, and other things. So regional agreements, regional trade agreements, the European Union started as a trade agreement and then uh, became a customs union where um, they have one currency. Um, and so all of these agreements, these international agreements that have countries who sign on to them are an attempt to facilitate and ease trade. Also, you might imagine it's an attempt to uh, facilitate dispute resolution as well. So let's get back to GATT. Under GATT, you're also, um, once you sign on to the trade agreement, not allowed to um, conduct in dumping, where you dump products that you have a surplus on of onto markets um, and sell them in order to get rid of them. Um, also, uh, GATT will control the kinds of subsidies uh, and governmental support for uh, particular industries. And all of those uh, lead to um, potential disputes. And disputes under GATT are sent to the World Trade Organization. And the World Trade Organization also has a dispute resolution um, part of it, which is arbitration, and that is where disputes under GATT will go to. And so that's a nice um, packaged um, uh, trade world, if you will, where once you sign that trade agreement, you're also agreeing to send those trade disputes to the World Trade Organization, um, which gets you out of domestic courts and essentially creates a world dispute resolution mechanism for trade disputes. Okay, then a couple of other things I want to talk about. We didn't quite get to in class these um, additional um, substantive law, um, bodies of substantive law. Um, so moving on from specific agreements, uh, trade or regional or custom u customs union, I want to mention uh, some areas of the law which we call substantive law. And substantive law is the black letter law, the actual rule that we're, the, the actual regulation that we're going to follow. And if you recall from the earlier chapters, that is not procedural law. So procedural law tells you how to file the complaint, what court you're going to go to, um, how many days somebody has to reply. But substantive, pardon me, substantive law is telling you what the actual black letter law is. What's the rule? 
So Lex Mercatoria is a very interesting um, body of merchant law. It's very old, and it's a source. Uh, it can be a source of contract law, uh, and your book raises it as a source of contract law. But it is a um, a understanding of uh, through uh, a merchant's understanding of international law. Um, as it really uh, is done in practice. So uh, Lex Mercatoria has contract aspects to it, and it can be relied upon uh, if a dispute um, comes about. So all of these international laws uh, also... Uh, have to be understood, um, particularly with U.S. companies, um, in light of what the U.S. law is. So uh, as parties to create contracts and international contracts, they will also need to designate what law controls that contract, particularly international contracts. Um, Lex Mercatoria could be the stated law that governs the contract or New York law. Um, it just depends on what the parties agree to in the contract. So Lex Mercatoria really developed over time, and it's a kind of a, a uh, understanding that merchants have when they deal with one another. Things like, um, you know, you're going to... Uh, once you agree to do what you say you're going to do, um, you do it. <laughs> that merchants um, are bound by their word, that they're going to deliver on time and pay on time, that kind of thing. Okay, moving on. So I just want to see if there was anything else we needed to pull out of the book on Lex Mercatoria. Um, uh, U.S., one, one final comment. U.S. law, contract law, um, other domestic contract law, as I mentioned, can be um, designated as the controlling law in a particular international contract. But if the contract is silent with respect to which law applies, um, then it really will depend who the parties are um, as to what the court will actually um, impose on them. Uh, are they U.S. companies dealing with European companies? Are, uh, and, and that can be a very interesting dispute as it goes forward. Okay, a second area of source of international contract law is called the Convention on the International Sale of Goods, or the CISG. And this is a UN convention. It's very similar to, um, from Chapter 4, the UN Convention for the Dis Res Resolution of International Disputes. Um, this convention governs the commercial sale of goods, and the commercial sale of goods is um, personal property that's traded between merchants, and uh, the CISG will define what a merchant is. Um, in order to be bound by the CISG, you have to sign it, and if you don't sign it, you're not bound by it. Another U.S. law that governs the sale of good, which you've already um, been introduced to, is the Uniform Commercial Code, the UCC. Um, and the UCC only applies when the two parties to a contract are U.S. entities or U.S. residents. The CISG applies when one of the parties is a, or both parties are signatories to from a nation that's a signatory or has signed the convention. 
So I put in your Blackboard a link to the UN website for the CISG for you to take a look at that. Um, really, you just need to know that it exists and that, um, that they provide contract provisions which merchants are bound by. Okay, and then finally, comparative employment law. So employment in the U.S. is generally governed by um, kind of an employment at will standard. Uh, unless you have a contract, you're an employee at will, which means that either the employee or the employer can, can terminate employment um, at will. They don't have to have cause. So um, what I would, I would like you to take a look at in this section of Chapter 6 are the um, kind of main uh, provisions of employment uh, relationships, which are, you know, what is the minimum wage that we are going to pay, and uh, how do we term, how do we safely and legally terminate employees? Um, minimum wage is very um, hot topic t uh, currently in the United States. Los Angeles raised its minimum wage to fifteen dollars. Um, a minimum wage is a, a federal wage, but states can adopt a, 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 that wage or a higher wage. They cannot have a lower wage than the minimum wage that's set. Um, and what gives the government the power to set the minimum wage is the Fair Labor Standards Act, um, the FLSA, which is mentioned in your book. Um, so making sure that em employment termination, making sure that uh, termination is fair, that termination is not um, because of uh, um, discrimination of a protected class like race, uh, gender, age, disability. And some of those laws are also regulated by separate laws. So it's not just... Um, um, what we have, what we'll see is when we get to the employment discrimination chapter that we have separate laws that also, in addition to um, our general understanding of employment at will, that, that govern uh, age discrimination, um, the American with Disabilities Act, that kind of thing. Um, and then what I mentioned a couple of times in class, uh, international labor standards, U.S. corporations, are bound wherever they're located by U.S. labor standards. Um, there are international labor standards that come from uh, human rights agreements uh, and apply across many, many areas. Um, there's a U.N. Declaration of Human Rights um, and uh, the International Labor Organization. Really what I want you to know is that these things exist. The U.S. isn't always a signatory to them uh, because um, uh, for many reasons, <laughs> um, because it interferes with uh, what we're doing uh, domestically and it um, can conflict with um, our constitution and uh, the st our structure of government. Okay, I think that's it. Chapter 6 wraps up with um, a topic that we've discussed in Chapter 4 and beyond, which is international dispute resolution. It's uh, how international disputes um, get resolved. It's a mechanism that's in an international contract, and I won't belabor that uh, since we covered that a lot in Chapter 4 but I want you to understand it in terms of the international um, um, component as opposed to domestic only in Chapter 4. Okay, so that is coverage of Chapter 6, and I will be talking to you soon.